Imagine yourself, but if you had made a slightly different choice at a key juncture in your life. Went to a different school, didn't break up with this or that partner, didn't quit that job. Fuck you, I'm out! Or kept smoking. Would it still really be you, or would the radically different sequence of events, born to your alternate choices, make you almost unrecognizable to yourself? This incredibly unnerving question is asked, among others, in the brilliantly written hit series Severance. In it, the main characters go through a particular procedure which renders their work self, who they are at work, completely severed from their home self. You go into an elevator and boom, no idea what's going on at home. You clock out, boom, you have no idea what just happened at work. But, and this is important, your work self, when you clock back in on the next day, remembers everything they had experienced on the previous workday. In a way, the first day you clocked in, the worker self was born. The work environment, a satirical, oversimplified version of an office where their daily task is to press random buttons and chase weird symbols on the screen without knowing why, becomes their world, the only thing they have ever known, their colleagues, the only people they will ever meet. So okay, uh, great uh, sci-fi setting, uh, work alienates, blah blah blah, YouTube essay number 67,349. Is that what we're going to be covering here? Well, no. Instead, let's treat the show's premise as a thought experiment and dive into a much more interesting dilemma. One on human nature versus nurture, or better yet, how much would you change? Would your worldview change? Would your moral compass and identity change if you had two versions of yourself? cut between two systems, two environments, informed by two differing ideologies. The most famous and arguably most insatiable cringe-inducing argument that gets thrown at people who fantasize about a post-capitalist world is, what about human nature? That simple question posits an even simpler view of human consciousness and decision-making. It says man is flawed through his greed, jealousy, and selfishness, and that as such, he would destroy and corrupt any system which doesn't utilize those very flaws, the way capitalism, for example, does with greed, by throwing us in the gladiatorial arena, Are you not entertained? Or to be more realistic, a children's sandbox of the free market where the greediest win. The human nature brain king that probably got that argument off of Reddit, that got it off of 9gag, that got it off of 4chan, who probably got it off of Mein Kampf or something. And so on and so on. See the current way we organize our economic states, called capitalism, as the final step of human evolution. They proceed to quote Churchill saying, If you are not a liberal when you are 25, you will have no part. If you are not a conservative by the time you are 35, blah, blah, blah. I never even said this, all that. I did say racist things about Indians. Or use terms my 14-year-old niece considers obsolete at this point, like the end of history, inadvertently positing that this megamall of a civilizational blip on our long history is supposed to be our peak. Their lack of vision would probably make Ray Charles call them blind. It would be absolutely fair to discuss and debate human nature as it was thousands of years ago, as we were first crawling up on two legs, a human nature informed almost exclusively by what our genetics, our bodies, hormones, and brains told us to do. Many fine thinkers from John Locke to Hobbes and all the way up to the most contemporary of philosophers obsess with this question. But to discuss human nature by analyzing the modern human is so brashly unscientific, it would rival that of flat earth theory. Why? Because experiments conducted in an uncontrolled environment aren't experiments, they're guesswork. The modern human psyche is informed by thousands if not millions of internal and external factors which inform their sense of identity, normalcy, and for the lack of a better word, nature. In a way, there is nothing natural about humans as they are today. And there hasn't been from the moment we altered our behavioral pattern to those of animals. Put as simply as possible, we live in a society. But no, seriously, the idea that we can extract what is natural instinct and what is a, quote, consequence of our environment in modern society would be like looking for a needle in a planet-sized haystack. Are you greedy because there's something rotten at your core or because the modern sense of accomplishment is tied to the pursuit of wealth? Are you jealous because it's coded in us to be or have thousands of hours of consumed content taught you that there's tons of people out there whose lifestyles you'll never reach or achieve? Are you bigoted because it's natural? natural to fight for your own in-group, or are you just brainwashed by divisive, hateful ideology? 
Not knowing the exact answer to those questions is exactly the point. No matter how many hypotheses exist on the tabula rasa, the clean slate, the pre-character creation screen version of ourselves, they will likely remain just that, hypotheses. But okay, you don't have to trust my word for it. Let's look at, uh, you know, quote unquote, trademarked real science. You do know what they say about twins, secretly parted, don't you? Over the last few decades, many social experiments were conducted on twins separated at birth, or at least at an incredibly young age. Scientists wanted to determine hundreds of differing environmental influences on individuals with extremely similar genetics. If you raise the same kid in two spots, how much do they differ? Basically, to answer the age-old question of if life quality equals genetics x environment, how big is one versus the other? The answers might be a bit more complicated than what we would expect, but I wouldn't call them exactly surprising. To quote Siegel, an expert on the topic, twin studies are simple, very elegant design. Holding the genetics constant allows researchers to study the age-old question of nature versus nurture, what aspects of a person came from their DNA and which come from their environment. There was a time when scientists tended to think one or the other factor was more important to development, but they have since come to realize how limiting it is to continue our understanding of behavior, health, and identity to this either-or dichotomy. Quote, nature and nurture work in concert. Siegel says, affecting every measurable human trait. In one study where two sisters separated at birth between the UK and the US, the results were rather self-explanatory. When it comes to general intelligence, the twins' IQ scores of 93 for the US and 82 for the UK were in the average and low average ranges respectively, yet very different. Overall, the twins' differences were more frequent than their similarities. Differences were most apparent in general intelligence, troop completion times, ideational fluency, psychomotor completion times, and medical health. Similarities included mental status, job satisfaction, and social support. The personality data yielded mixed findings, and the twins approached their relationships with one another from different perspectives, but were pleased to have met. In general, behavioral and physical differences between the twins appeared linked to genetic factors and to UK's childhood illnesses. The way they ended up living, which is arguably the most important part though, was arguably radically different. But in another case from 79, Jim Springer and Jim Lewis, the Jim twins, were reunited at age 39 after not knowing the other existed. As described in Siegel's book on the identical Jim twins born together, reared apart, both had been adopted and raised by different families in Ohio, just 40 miles apart from each other. So not exactly very different environments. But despite their separate upbringings, it turned out that both twins got terrible migraines. Both explained their same mixed headache syndrome in exactly the same way as if someone is beating on their head with a hammer. Bit their nails, smoked Salem cigarettes, drove light blue Chevrolets, did poorly in spelling and math, and had worked at McDonald's and as part-time deputy sheriffs. But the weirdest part was that one of the Jim twins had named his first son James Allen, the other had named his first son James Allen. Both had named their pet dogs Toy, both had also married women named Linda. You guys. Then they got divorced and both married women named Betty. Now, this might sound rather sensationalist because let's be honest, it is. Even them, two men with the same genetic code living in a relatively similar environment and having gone through incredibly similar life events, had their differences. For starters, one divorced Betty and married a woman named Sandy, which, uh, as Siegel jokes, must have caused worry for the other still married Betty. But it gets even more complicated. The reasons why identical twins, even very young ones, have differences at all, not just in life outcomes, but temperament, taste, physical traits, can come down to random chance, but it can also be traced to how each sibling's identical genes are expressed. Basically, just having certain genes doesn't mean they will influence your life. These microscopic variations in lifestyle can lead to radical differences in a person's health, personality, and even appearance. The study of how this works is known as epigenetics. 
For example, one can be influenced by lifestyle and diet, as we said. Researchers are also looking at epigenetics to explain exactly why some twins start out with the same characteristics, but dramatically diverge as they age. And perhaps why one twin may suffer from an illness, while the other one is not affected at all. In a study published in the National Academy of Sciences, 80 pairs of identical twins ranging in age from 3 to 74 were studied. They discovered that 35% of twins revealed a difference in genes. The study suggests that genes are regulated by epigenetics and that as twins aged, their DNA also changed. Their life basically started modifying their genetic code. To me, that is absolutely wild. Whoa. Researchers believe that external factors could dramatically change certain expressions of genes by causing them to become, for example, irregular. While the epigenetic debate of what makes us who we are is still undecided, researchers lean to the idea that all external and internal influences encourage and affect our behavior. And because of twins, science is taking closer steps in uncovering the truths of said human behavior. Quote, no longer is it nature versus nurture, but nature via nurture, writes Dr. Matt Ridley in The Agile Gene, How Nature Turns on Nurture. Quote, you will have to enter a world where your genes are not puppet masters pulling the strings of your behavior, but puppets at the mercy of your behavior. A world where instinct is not the opposite of learning, where environmental influences are sometimes less reversible than genetic ones, and where nature is designed for nurture. Basically, in normal people language, while using separated and non-separated twins in a search for answering whether environment or genetics influence someone's outcome, financial, health, what we believe, we found out far more about ourselves than we might have expected. While the set of traits we are born with does help set us out on one path or another, while it may influence some of our preferences and traits, the moment we leave our parents' womb, the moment we start interacting with the outside environment, our genes, our nature begins to alter and adapt, building up unique individuals who transform the world, while the world, in a very literal and philosophical sense, transforms them. So, next time someone says humans are wired to behave in a particular way and use that as a reason to why the world can't change, remind them that the world changing would change how we are wired. Cause when you stretch our love across our time, time becomes a construct of the mind. It's the practice of did you know that millennials are the least wealthy generation, despite the fact that they currently represent the largest group in the workforce? Business Insider reports that boomers are 10 times wealthier than millennials. It gave birth to the term generational wealth gap, which describes the difference between the amount of wealth accumulated within one generation relative to the wealth accumulated within another generation. By wealth, we mean savings, investment, and other forms of assets, including real estate. Productivity has literally never been higher, yet the buying power of younger workers is nowhere even near to that of boomers or even Gen Xers. This sort of rhetoric is usually used as a tool to inspire division amongst generations, implying the boomers owe us something or that millennials are waiting around for a handout. This is baby logic and saying goo goo gaga goo goo would make more sense. The main difference, talking about the Western Hemisphere here, between generations, between one decade or another, is the economic environment in which those people exist exist. Economic downturns, global conflicts, or internal strife lead to greater toxicity in the market and therefore inhibit people's ability to save and to prosper. Sure, that's true, but these problems are constantly pitched to us as temporary, and yet they are arguably the greatest constant of this system. Put the words capitalism and stability together, and what you will get is a joke because that doesn't exist. The continuous, unavoidable deterioration of the system due to its lack of favorability to the majority through greater wealth concentration in a tiny minority is no longer able to sufficiently explain its own reason for existence to the masses. It has 
in quite a literal sense, created radically different environments and therefore radically different outcomes for the same peoples in the same land and the same environment and with the same cultures and extremely similar ideologies. There is no greater proof of the impact of our environment on our social and financial performance throughout our lives than that of the generational wealth gap. Our parents married earlier, had families earlier, bought their houses earlier, and accrued a hilariously lower amount of debt than we did. Why? Because marriage costs less, having kids cost less, houses cost 30 bloody billion times less. Billy Jr. unavoidably has quite a bit of Billy Sr.'s nature in him, but that never did, nor does it now, mean he will end up achieving what Sr. did before him. The environment breeds success, and therefore the environment must be altered to allow for success. And yes, some do make it even in the harshest of places, but this exception to the rule in its infinitely tiny proportion is exactly the proof of the definition. The passing of time has altered what we define as normal human behavior, what we define as ethical and moral, what is defined as human nature. Claiming it can't change and yet being vastly different to your parents is some truly, truly clown shit. Now, let's bring back the allegory with the characters from Severance we mentioned at the beginning. Same people, totally different environments, equal significantly different people. Sure, characters A, B, C, and D are different genders, ages, ethnicities, come from different parents, and that, to an extent, does slightly influence them and their behavior. Call that their human nature, their inherent drives, but it's the environment and people in said environment that end up actually molding them into totally unique people as contrasted to their out-of-work versions. We touched on how our genetics react to the environment. We touched on how the functionality of the environment influences our financial outcomes. But we left the most important aspect for last. What we spend the majority of our waking hours doing. Work. And how work, just like in good old severance, can completely change our sense of self, normalcy, and drive. So who better to talk about work than Marx? To quote, a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He not only effects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives him the law to his modus operandi, and to which he must subordinate his will. And this subordination is no mere momentary act. Only because of that is this activity free activity. A strange labor reverses the relationship so that man, just because he is conscious being, makes his life activity, his essential being, a mere means for his existence. In rather crude, normal people terms, he posits an incredible observation, that man, when it comes to his labor, his work, is different to animals because of why and how he performs it. He can only remain true to his nature when he is allowed to express that labor by choice, and not out of alienated necessity, like an animal. To further quote, in fact, the realm of freedom actually begins only where labor, which is determined by necessity and mundane considerations, ceases. Thus, in the very nature of things, it lies beyond the sphere of actual material production, just as the savage must wrestle with nature to satisfy his wants to maintain and reproduce life, so must civilized man, and he must do so in all social formations and under all possible modes of production. In a funny twist of irony. The system, which we presumably cannot change because of our nature, is a system which drives us furthest away from said nature. When labor feels purposeless because we are one in a billion cogs of a machine of unimaginable scale, when labor feels stolen because we get cents on the dollar for what we create, when the world our parents praise no longer welcomes us, it doesn't matter even if we disregard what the economists, geneticists, or philosophers from this video think about human nature. Because we, just like an animal struggling in its current environment, must either evolve or lay down in a grave of our own making. 
human nature as an excuse for inaction is not only unscientific, but also pathetic. Well, that was different. If you'd like to support this channel, consider donating over on PayPal or Patreon. For the price of less than one can of beer, you'd be helping the channel stay as independent as possible. If not, then hit all those buttons you see on screen, like subs, bells. It helps the channel fight the algorithm. Now that we got that out of the way, I'd like to thank all the wonderful Tavarishi without whom this channel wouldn't even be able to run. Especially... The Mining Comrade, Jason Harrison, Romy Senpai, Holden Fan, String Bebop Cola, Abraham, Ron Wayne, Fred Drennan, Butis Play Name, Red American, Strip, 3NB1, Probably Fang, Thank Kiss Possible, Maitaki Kun, Kaylee's, Lilia, Red Messiah, Nibino, Beanat, Soup, Deep Red Wine, Their Devil, Anastasia, Mayner, Gato Marks, Fate Forka, Loss, Jocelyn, Just In Case, Exploited Human Commodity Guy, Mason, Danny Boy, Mugichina, Dead Spartan 08, Noel Hendai, Sean, Nicola Devanami, Short Frank, Thomas Ross and Rude, The Poltism, Zane Gevara, The Muffin Man, Boyan, Alki Historical, User, Common Face, M&Ames, Marussia, Asa Rabakara. <laughs>